Story time with Stephanie Story. Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to the show. My name is Stephanie Story, art historical novelist. This is my show, Story Time. Uh, my guest today, I am uh, honored that he is joining me here today. Uh, he is a longtime writer out in Hollywood, written for such iconic shows as the original Roseanne, uh, Gilmore Girls, and Golden Girls, which come on, who doesn't love the Golden Girls? Uh, he's also a, a longtime theater guy. And in fact, right now, during this whole pandemic, they're doing a play per view reading of Knife to the Heart featuring Wendy Malick of Just Shoot Me and Hot in Cleveland. Uh, it's going to be live streaming on July 25th. Go get your tickets at Eventbrite or Play Per View, and we'll hear more about that. I have so many questions uh, for my guests. Thank you for coming on the show. Welcome, Stan Zimmerman. Thank you for having me. And it's Play Per View. Play per view. Because it's a play per view. And the money for this reading will go to savethechildren.org and the COVID-19 fund because the play is about uh, an interfaith couple having finding out they're pregnant, having a baby, and then the Jewish mother is like, of course, you're going to have a bris. And you know what a bris is? Yes, I know what a bris is, but not everybody at home not everybody. Well, might the, not know the, what a bris is. Uh, the woman in the play, the young wife, does not know. So she says, yeah, she thinks it's like a party. And then her gay friend says, oh, no, 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 She opens a computer and says, he says, let me show you what a circumcision is. And so it's a comedy about that, but it actually gets into faith and why we do the things we do in faith. And so it gets into a much heavier discussion. And um, the Jewish mother, she almost de-Jewed her son by not wanting him to like relive the horrors of the Holocaust. So she didn't tell him about all of that, which was kind of my generation, uh, that we were kind of removed from it. We had, you know, grandparents with funny accents and we didn't really know. And then through this, they discuss why it is important. And the mother tells this beautiful story about how she learned arithmetic, sitting in her aunt's lap by the numbers on her aunt's arm. And that it's like, everyone's laughing and then it's like, Oh my God. So I really like to, in my work, combine really funny things, but also learning and serious things. I think when you're, okay, you can take your hand off your- No, I can't. I'm, I have 50,000 things going on inside my head, go. Yeah. So go. I do that a lot. I wrote a play uh, based on my mother dealing with dementia, which is in the model of like a Golden Girls feel to it. And it's um, about the relationship between my mother and my longtime housekeeper, Virginia Campbell. And um, so I, I like to do that. And then I've also gotten into, now we're skipping way ahead, into more serious things. But I'm basically, and I know you as, you know, you know me as a comedy writer. And that's kind of where I began, you know, with Golden Girls and, and Roseanne, where I met the wonderful Mike Gandolfi. And, um, who is my husband, for people who yeah. don't know. I know Stan because he um, and, and, and Mike have known each other for a very long time. Yeah, so we were on uh, the crazy time when Tom and Roseanne were still together and we lived through all that wonderfulness. I should have worn my number 13 um, t-shirt. Does Mike still have his? He does. So, so for, he, he does, he still has it like locked up in his, um, in, in just away in the closet. He doesn't get the stuff out. But for those people who don't know, uh, why don't I let you tell the story about how all the all the writers were numbered? So there were 21 writers on the show and because Roseanne had such a habit of firing everybody, she thought it'd be funny if the day, the first day of work, instead of getting to know everyone's name, if she gave the writers all numbers, so she could just point and say, number 18, you're gone. So she made us line up. And because my birthday is October 13th, I thought it'd be really funny. I'll get, I'll stand in line, get number 13, which I still have. The other writers were furious. They thought that was not cool at all. And I was just so into getting my number 13. I didn't really think about what an awful thing to do to your staff that's gonna work so hard for you. <laughs> but, um, you know, there's so many crazy, crazy things that we experienced, but she was, which is so weird because she was so wonderful when uh, Jim Berg and I wrote uh, the Lesbian Kiss episode that became kind of famous. And, you know, ABC was not gonna air the episode at all. And to the credit of Tom and Roseanne, they said, if you don't air it, we'll buy it back and put it on HBO for the night. So they went to the mat for 
for us and, and our community. And that was so great. So I, you know, that's why it's so hard to reconcile with the person she is today, because she was always such a fighter, you know, I'm sure as Mike knows, for the underdog. When I first saw her uh, stand-up routine, I happened to wake up one night, at, you know, at, I saw her on The Tonight Show, I think, her first appearance. I was like, who is this person talking about these issues? I had never seen anyone like that. So the next day I called my agent and I said, this Roseanne person, Arnold, I think, or she was then, or I don't know what she was. And um, he was like, no one's going to want to watch a fat person on TV. Yeah, that's, that's what, what your agent about. said? Yeah, yeah. And, but you have to remember back at those times, it was very specific look that you kind of had to have. And, and luckily, we've gone much further. And hopefully, we're going to go even much further by being even more diverse in who we get to watch on television. Um, so I've literally seen and lived this experience of coming to Hollywood, being on the Golden Girls. There you go. <laughs> My line, and I had to buy the coffee cup. Being in the closet, being told by our agents to be in the closet while you're at work. Then going to a show like Roseanne where Tom Arnold would run around the halls going, where are my gay guys? That was me and Jim. Um, and then now, and, you know, at the beginning, we were the only um, gay writers on the show. Uh, there were, in the beginning, not a lot of women writers on the show. So I had to be the one and wanted to be the one that would stand up and say, that's a sexist line. Or can we write a little more full character for these women? They don't have to just be pretty. We can give them other characteristics, you know, make them complicated and interesting and all of that. Two, going to shows where like I could hire mostly female staff, which was so great. I mean, that would be my dream is just to be, and I've done that in a couple of the plays I've directed. I just look around and it's like, my stage manager is a woman, my co-producer is a woman, my cast is women, and I'm in heaven. <laughs> Mike got to Roseanne but Mike is Mike Antolfi, my husband, and he got to the show because he was a stand-up comic with Tom Arnold and Roseanne and all of these other comics who were coming up at, the, up at the time. How did you get to the show? Roseanne, actually, we were offered the first season of Roseanne to go on staff for it, and we turned it down. But I, I know. At that time, we were being offered like three or four shows a season, I loved Roseanne, but Lori and John were not attached to the show at that time. And they just said, here's the show. Um, they were having some problems with it. And you had, we had to commit to seven years of our life to it. And we were like, I don't know, like seven years is a long time. We need to know more. And then we, for some reason, we just said no. It came back to us in, I think, season five. And, um, and so that's when we came back on and we met. We got called to Tom and Roseanne's house, never met Roseanne, met Tom, and he hired us literally on the spot. Okay. And, um, and then there we were on the show. And it was, it was actually very scary for us, as even then we were kind of, you know, we had experience on shows, but it was to be in a room full of such funny people. And, you know, stand-up comedy people, as you know that world, they're just funny like that. Like Jim and I craft a joke. We feel we're writers and we need to, we talk it out back and forth and we figure it out like you. But these stand-up people are just like, boom, boom, out of their mouth. And I'm like, oh my God. I, so there were some rooms, because there were so many that split us up into many different rooms, as Michael, I'm sure, told you. That some rooms I felt really comfortable and I could just say anything. And then other rooms, I was just like silent. I just, something came over me. I couldn't talk. Um, so it was a very difficult experience. I mean, I'm very proud of what we did on there. And I just loved the show. I loved what we were saying. I loved just the idea that on that show, it was like real life and that people died and got married and things happened to them. It was funny and yet it was really also very tragic. Then in 2015, I actually went to Moscow to help them de develop a Russian Roseanne show. You didn't know that, did you? I did not know that. That's a whole other like half hour of, of your show. If we get <laughs> well, we could talk about that and being there during the sanctions and all the crazy stuff. And I was scared to death. And right before I went, they put a ban on anything homosexual. So I called up Sony and I said, "You do know that some of these scripts have like lesbian kiss episodes. Yeah. Like if I uttered that out loud, I could be arrested." 
how are you dealing with this? Yeah, I know. They said, uh, first of all, they said we will have, um, they hired a, almost like a secret service agency that would, if anything ha happened crazy in the country, we would be like, you know, zipped out of there like Tom Cruise. Yeah, that's reassuring. I know you're, you're, the whole time we're talking, you're going to be like I, this. I am. I'm just going to cover my face the entire time you're telling me. Don't, don't touch your face. And you're touching. You're touching. I it. haven't been anywhere. I've washed my hands. Go ahead. That's good. Um, and but they said, you know, it really Roseanne's show didn't get into those subjects until season, Later. you know, three, mm -hmm. four, five. So they said, don't worry about. It. We just want to get this launched. So I went there and I was thinking like. You know, Roseanne was discovered and she was a, a waitress and then did stand up. And I'm going to go to every stand up comedy club in all of, you know, Siberia and Russia. And I get there, they have no comedy clubs there. I'm like, what? Why not? They just don't. <laughs> they don't. There's like, I'm like, well, how are we going to find this woman? And um, yeah, so I started, I went to theater. I went to the Moscow Art Theater. I saw a streetcar named Desire in Russian. Fantastic. It was, and you're sitting there thinking, this is where like Stanislavski and all those great mm -hmm. actors and they, they, you know, grew into the whole um, natural, natural acting style, you know, back mm -hmm. then, uh, rather than being presentational. So that, okay. that was a crazy time. Yeah. You've mentioned it several times and the people who are watching at home won't know. You and Jim are longtime writing partners. And NYU. I went to NYU to be an actor. We met at NYU in the dorm and just made each other laugh. I never thought of myself as a writer because I know you're going to be very upset with me looking at what's behind you. See, you have all those books. I have a TV and then I have stacks of my plays that I have lined up that I was going to do. Mm -hmm. That's a whole other subject, but um, I was never a reader. So I didn't feel like I could be a writer. And when I wrote papers in school as a kid, and these are for all those kids out there that are listening, I felt like you got better grades if you used more adjectives and were flowery. And I was very like to the point in my writing. So I didn't get good grades in writing. That's good. It's good to be to the point in your writing. Sorry. Not back then it wasn't, but actually for television it is because in a weird way it taught us to be brief. We have to write these shows that are 23 minutes. So my to the pointness helped me in my TV writing, but in school it didn't so they didn't really encourage me to read jim was a journalism major so he came through it us and our partnerships through words and i came through it through acting and discussing well the character wouldn't say you have to follow an actor's motivation through a scene and that's how we came together with these two very different principles and still we're still writing together today we're working on silver foxes a, a gay men's type golden girls show that, that's the abbreviated way to say it it's it's about a group of men that have known each other they're older and they're gay and okay there's, there's one young young one okay the twink, the twink they can't remember his name because uh their friend keeps going through different twinks every five years he like he leases the car yeah so um we did write it for logo they couldn't, we did a big reading at my house with George Takei and Leslie Jordan and, and Bruce Valanche and Todd Sherry, and that got a lot of press. And then Logo couldn't afford to make the show. And then no network would even read the script. They wouldn't open the script because it was gay and it was old demo, you know, demographic. Yeah. So I think you know me by now. I don't take no for an answer. So Jim and I turned it into a play, which we just finished with George Takei wants to do in New York. We're putting together a reading of it. We're also going out at the same time uh, in the new landscape to streaming places to do like a Grace and Frankie kind of show at the same time. So we're pitching it simultaneously for theater and as well as the TV show. You started out your career as an actor, right? As an so actor, but oh, when I was a little kid doing plays at seven and a half, I would rewrite the plays at the theater school I was going to in the summer and I didn't tell the people that were running the place that I was changing the plays and I would make them funnier and I just get out there and do them and the other actors would just go along with me or I'd wear a funny costume or something I would do and they couldn't complain because people were like laughing hysterically at all these like old very corny prince and princesses plays but you know I would come out with funny you know big my dad's sneakers or something and you know, once I heard that first laugh, it's like a jolt went up my spine. I was like, 
Mm -hmm. I'm home. This is what I need to do. So, you know, even if I'm directing a play, there's nothing better than sitting in the back of a theater and hearing an audience laugh at something you wrote or some bit that you came up with. And that's what's been so hard these past couple of months and seeing my friends that their careers in New York City decimated. They cannot work until next year. And I just had to cancel a show that I moved from May to October, and now I have to move it to next February. So that happened yesterday, and it was, I had to write the cast, and just this, my heart sank. You know, I had all these plans, and I just loved the idea, and I was doing a, a revival of, Wend of a Wendy Wasserstein play, and I don't know if you know about her, she's this amazing writer, the first woman to ever win a Tony Award for Best Play, and a, pu a Pulitzer Prize at the same time. And um, she died of cancer. She would have been 70 this October. And uh, I really wanted to celebrate her because she was coming of age when I was in New York as a student. And I got to see her writing plays about women, about complicated women. And they were messy plays. And I learned, usually plays, you know, they have a beginning and then they teach you a lesson and they learn. She just threw problems at you and like, they messed up. It was all about, can women have it all? And she didn't give you an answer. You left the theater wanting to talk about, well, can you? I don't know. She did. She didn't. What would you do? And I, that really, I think, affected me and got me thinking about, that's what I want to do. I want to write for, for women. I mean, you've ended up writing for so many iconic women. We talked about Roseanne, but the Golden Girls, which is, I think I've watched every episode of the Golden Girls 800 times, right? Like as, as you should. <laughs> right? It just, it just makes the world a better place. And then you also wrote on a show with another group of iconic women, which my husband was on as well, uh, the Gilmore Girls. Yes. Um, and that's, talk about the growth between Roseanne getting all the way to the Gilmore Girls. H how much changed from your perspective between those two shows? Or, or did it not change that much? I mean, Roseanne was, was she was on the front edge of everything. But I just oh, feel like there's yeah. such a different voice and there's such a different attitude. For all when you look at like Susan Harris's voice or Roseanne's voice or Amy's voice. Um, but the consistency is that they were all very strong women. And when people, the number one question I always get is like, what made you think you could write for women? And I said, well, I had a very vocal grandmother, mother, and sister. And I listened. When I started acting at seven and a half, they said, just listen. Go to a mall and listen to people. And if I don't, if I think I didn't hear that at such a young age, I don't think I could have. Because a lot of people, they just write from their own experiences. But I'm such a sensitive person. I go and listen, and I always think, what would I feel like if I put myself in their shoes? If, if you could paint your ideal world, Stan Zimmerman, which would you do? Would you do TV? Would you do theater? Would you do movies? Would you do books? What would you do? You're gonna hate me. No. I would not write. I would want to direct plays. Direct. The ones I've already written, I like, I would do. But I've also been involved in directing other plays like I did uh, a Latinx version of the Diary of Anne Frank to make the connection to you saw. We saw and we loved, and I was going to bring it up earlier, but then you kept talking about something else and I couldn't get back to it. It was brilliant. Go ahead. So I've been wanting to connect art and advocacy together. So that kind of opened me up to like, I can do something as a, a artist and make a change and provoke discussion, which I did when the right wing falsely claimed that I had changed the play and made the Nazis ice agents. And I was doing the 97 version that Natalie Portman did on Broadway. Word for word, I just cast Latinx actors with everybody in the mm -hmm. attic. At that time, nobody was making the connection what was happening in the world. Now AOC is, and a lot of people are saying, you know, as, you know, let it not go to that. I'm not saying it's the same thing. And then also, not to bum you out, but I, I also created a play using real suicide notes after a very close friend of mine died by suicide seven years ago. And it was like vagina monologues using real notes read by four actors and notes like Kurt Cobain and Virginia Woolf and war veterans and LGBTQ and kids that were bullied. And then two years ago, my director said, you need to tell your friend's story within this play. It'll add humor and humanity. So I created a narrator type character. It wasn't gonna be me, but as it kept, you know, as a writer, you kept having to open your heart and put yourself out there and everyone that read it or heard me read it say you need to put you in there so now it's about a 
comedy writer, when something tragic happens to someone like me, how do you deal with it? Because you don't have those tools. You're always making light of things. And so I didn't know anything about the subject. And what do you do? You open your computer and I start typing in suicide notes. And that's when the other actors pop up and start reading them and teaching me as I work to find another, yeah, as I work to find and get my friend's suicide note because his ex-lover that had it wasn't letting us read it at the time, so. Okay. Yeah. But so I, and I was supposed to do that at Fairfield University, March 24th, and then COVID hit. And so I had to come home to uh, LA, but I'm hoping when this is over, I can get back because I've been doing it. I did it at Claremont High School with high school students, faculty, and board members. I did it with the teen cast in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, I did it with adults in Orlando. I, I would love to be able to go around literally the world and talk about a subject that there's so much shame around with humor, but also with love and educating, so. Do you know what, what inspired you as a young person to really want to tell other people's stories? Do you know what even got you into this? I just thing? loved entertainment. And I always had this crazy mind and these ideas. I was obsessed with television. So at a young age, I wasn't out playing football or baseball for obvious reasons. So I was in my bedroom and uh, I created my own TV network. And I literally mapped out seven days a week of programming. So I came up with my own shows or like I love Lily Tomlin. So I had her, she needed to have her own variety show, I thought. Enough with these specials, a weekly show. Or if a show got canceled, like Taxi, I would put it on my network or different things like that. And so I was always like up with ideas, but again, because I didn't think I was a writer, I could just have ideas. And oddly enough, I only knew writing from the Dick Van Dyke show because it was about the backstage of writing a TV show. And I thought in my mind, I don't know where I got this, 15, 16 years old, if I could meet someone that could help me with my ideas, but new words. And in walked Jim Berg. I kind of created him a writing partner. But I always only thought that I could write with someone else. And it wasn't until I did this reality show for Bravo that I suddenly found my own voice and wings. And that's when I started directing on my own. And uh, I, I do write plays with um, Christian McLaughlin and then the suicide plays by myself. So that was the first play I ever did all on my own. Was it scary to do one? All, because Hollywood, it is. It's such a collaborative industry. When you're in those writer's rooms, you're all in it together. Was it scary to do I it? I like it. I like having a partner, especially in a comedy. Like, I'll just say something. And if Jim laughs, I'll go, what's so funny? And he'll go, no, it's going in. And he'll put it in and vice versa. The suicide thing I started, I think it was easy because I'm just taking real notes and putting notes and facts. And then all of a sudden this director's like, no, you've got to tell your story. And then that was like, holy moly, I've got to write from here. And that's why I think over the years now I have the courage to do that and tell the story. And I feel like with that, that story, I have to tell it. I don't have a choice. You know, it's, so, it's too important not to be able to help other people with it. I love it that that's where your career is taking you is to, is to using your art and, and your work as advocacy. Not that, look, these huge shows were advocates in their own way. Is yes, that what you were. got part of it? Because Roseanne certainly was. I certainly felt like I learned a lot about being a woman and having friends and about morality from the, fr from the Golden Girls. I'm sorry. That's where I feel like I got part of it. Okay, sorry. We all did. I did too. I got to hear, you know, different women's points of view. And it was just, it was so illuminating. And and especially on Roseanne, all those different points of view. Um, and even Gilmore Girls, I mean, all the people in town. And it was just a different style of writing, which was so cool. You know, almost like a 40s movie, very fast paced. And, mm -hmm. you know, and to have just the best actors, you know, all along, the best actors say your line are, are pretty cool. But um, it's, it, it, I think because I'm so sensitive, I do want to feel like if I could make a difference, even if people are laughing, but it has been a consistent thing with hitting these, and not on purpose, these hot button issues, whether it's like two women kissing on TV or, you know, connecting the Holocaust and what's happening with separation of Latin families 
uh, suicide. I don't know why. It's just um, what I'm drawn to. Oh, but that's a, it, it, it's a beautiful thing, particularly someone coming from sitcoms, because I don't know that everybody who come from, comes from sitcoms, not that I don't love sitcoms. I'm married to a, form, to a sitcom writer. I love them. I'm not saying that. But not everybody ends up using that power to enact social change. So um, and I think that's why I want to get Silver Foxes going, because I think telling the story, it's such, there's still so much ageism in this world, and it's okay. You know, you see different programs where they'll say, you know, we want, you know, different sexes or different, uh, you know, origins of people. But yet they say only between 21 and 40. I'm like, wait a minute. Some people, it doesn't matter, haven't gotten their big break when they're older. And, you know, and so to be able to talk about uh, their situations. And uh, we had seen a, um, a documentary called Gen Silent about how uh, aging gays and lesbians had to go back in the closet when they went into assisted living places. And that's kind of the, the storyline of our pilot. Yeah, we didn't know either. Can you imagine your whole life, you're finally busting out and you're you know, out of the closet, you're fighting it, and then now you've got to go back in and you can't touch your partner or you can't talk about who you are. So I do not want to see that happen to go backwards. You know, so that's... Um, that's one of the characters in the pilot. That's their story. And the other characters have your same reaction. They can't believe it. So yeah. I, oh, I genuinely could have sat here and talked to you for the rest of the night. But um, if you, I'll, I'll, we'll just have to do the eight episodes. Turn, why don't we turn the camera off and you and I keep talking? Right? We can just keep why talking. We, Look, we'll you're we'll Dorothy. Some, we'll get some wine, though. Forget the coffee and, and, and keep going. There you go. Thank you so much for joining oh, me, Stan. You. That's very sweet of you, and uh, I miss seeing you, and give your husband a big hug for me, and I hope one day it can all be in person again. Me too. I do too, and I cannot wait uh, to see uh, Knife to the Heart. We're yeah, going to tune in. I think it's really important now in these days to give people a chance to laugh. There's so much misery and things we're all fighting, so for an hour and 20 minutes, come have a laugh, and you'll think a little bit too, but and most be, be laughing at these wonderful actors and hopefully some funny lines. Story time with Stephanie Story. Story time virtually. We've got time and plenty of stories. Talking stories in a 